So basically, I'm just going to kind of go through the main parts with diet for you all. Um, if you've got anything that you don't really understand, just stop me and ask me. But I will be available for the question and answers. So if there's something in a bit more detail, I can answer it then, if that's OK. But I'm sure you're all aware that there's many different types of neuroendocrine tumors. And then there's many different types of symptoms and different kind of medications and things that you'll all be on and it'll all be different for everybody. So kind of why I have up there with this work for my friend. So just to kind of bear in mind, what worked for your friend might not work for you or your friend or your family member. So it's all quite individual to an extent. So what Mark asked me to mainly cover today will be to look at enzymes. So a lot of people might be on enzymes, might need them. So we'll go through kind of the signs and symptoms of why you might need them and also kind of how to take them, when to take them, because I know there can be a lot of confusion over that area as well with it. Um, and then we'll look at diarrhea and carcinoid syndrome. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to cover every single thing up there in terms of symptoms, and I know there's a lot more than that as well. But I've just kind of tried to cover the main areas as much as possible and just trying to to get you yourself to kind of recognize what your symptoms might be and what might work for you. So I apologize that it won't all be relevant for all of you, but just to, um, but just to be aware of the bits that are more so than anything else. So what is the role of diet in neuroendocrine tumors? So just firstly, I think it's just important that we clarify that it's not a treatment, it's more a symptom management. So I think it kind of leads on to what Justin was saying and what some of the others were saying about survivorship and how it is that how it is longer now. But whether your, survive, your survival length is 22 years like Tommy or um, maybe a year, what we want to do is manage your symptoms so that you feel as well as possible for as long as possible. The other thing really as well, a lot of people find they might be losing a lot of weight. Few people might be gaining some extra weight, so what's important dietary-wise is stabilizing your weight. Um, improving recovery times. So the better nourished you are, going into things like surgery, having things like chemotherapy, radiotherapy, some of the treatments, they, your recovery after can take any length of time. The better nourished you are, the better your recovery time will be. Um, same with maximizing the outcome of your treatment. It's the exact same principle as the recovery time. And then just lastly, preventing nutritional deficiencies that you may be at risk of. So a lot of people can, will say that they have diarrhea. And there's a lot of, I think what really the kind of thing is, is somebody might come into clinic and be like, I have diarrhea, solve me. <laughs> but it's not that easy because there's lots of different causes of the diarrhea and lots of different symptoms and things along those lines. So you might find they'll ask you more questions about it. So some of them can be malabsorption, and that can be due to pancreatic enzyme insufficiency, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or bile acid malabsorption. And I'll go through all of them in a lot more detail. Um, also hormone, so like carcinoid syndrome, um, if you've got a tumor producing gastrin, glucagon, vasointestinal peptides, any of those can cause diarrhea. Um, surgery, so anyone here who's had any surgery, especially around anywhere in the intestines, any stomach, pancreas, any of those can cause diarrhea. And then actually your treatment itself. So the medications that you can be given may cause it. Sunitab um, is one of them that does. Um, also things like radiotherapy, chemotherapy, depending which one you're on, that can cause it as well. So just so that you yourself can recognize and that you may actually recognize why you might get asked some of these questions. So with malabsorption and kind of how it'd be different than diarrhea, so the kind of signs and symptoms that might be. So if you've got quite a bit of malabsorption, you might find that you've got something called that we call steatorrhea. And what that basically means is fat in your stools. And this can appear where they might look actually greasy depending if you do look at them, but we will advise you to check them. Um, they may look pale in color, funny color, yellow, orange, gray, kind of a mustardy kind of color, can vary between any of those. They can be hard to flush away because they might float just because oil does float. Um, then you might also find as well, you may not have exactly those symptoms, but they might be just larger in volume or they might look a, look a bit frothy. 
It might also be that you could feel like you're eating and eating and eating, but you're not putting on weight. And that may be because you're not absorbing all the nutrients, all the fats, the proteins, the carbohydrates from your food. Therefore, you're not able to actually gain weight. So if you find that you're eating a lot, your weight's staying the same, it might be a, might be a sign of it. Um, also, things like symptoms might be worse if you have a fatty meal. So just to kind of bear in mind, a lot of people do tend to kind of naturally decrease their fat intake going, oh, I had a takeaway that, that day and I just felt awful after it. Oh, I felt horrible after that pizza. So they do kind of naturally reduce their fat intake. So just kind of to bear that in mind if that's something that you have done. Other kind of symptoms, um, so you may not notice it in your bowels, especially if you're on medications like painkillers, um, they can slow everything down. If you're on iron, that gives you kind of that will give you constipation. So you may find that you don't actually have the bowel symptoms, but what you do have is a lot of extra wind, a lot of extra bloating. After you eat, you feel just a lot of indigestion. And just some people just even say they just don't feel right after eating. And so it so it's just to kind of keep in mind what kind of symptoms that you have yourself. Um, and then kind of longer term, it would be you may have symptoms of vitamins deficiency, so like night blindness and osteoporosis, but that's in your longer term. So as I said, we'd kind of go through each of them. So there's pancreatic enzyme insufficiency, and that is where your pancreas may not produce enough enzymes to mix with the food to digest it and allow you to or absorb, all the, absorb all the nutrients and the goodness from the food. So that may be also happen if the pancreas isn't producing it at the right time. So it's not mixing with the food. So it might be due to your gut transit time and how, how long things take to move through. So the main risks of getting, of getting pancreatic enzyme insufficiency would be one if you have a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor in your pancreas, particularly in the head of the pancreas. So more, far more so than the other end. So the head of the pancreas is the part that's closest to your stomach and closest to your intestines, and that's where we produce the majority of our enzymes from. The other would be if you had surgery, so especially to the pancreas, um, especially to the head of the pancreas, um, for the same reason, because you're removing some of the cells that will produce your enzymes. Um, also, neuroendocrine tumors that release somatostatin and gastrin, they also can cause a reduction in the amount of enzymes that are produced. So that's another common factor. And also other surgeries, so kind of like we mentioned about how the, pancre the pancreatic enzymes might mix with the food. So sometimes if somebody's had a gastrectomy, so the removal of their stomach, or even just part of their stomach removed, food will move through too quickly to allow it to mix with the, mix with the enzymes. And therefore that can, cause a that can cause pancreatic enzyme insufficiency. And then last but not least, a common treatment that a lot of you are on, so that it can happen, where the somatostatin analogs, so your lanreotide, um, your octreotide, any of those, what ha happens is, is they dry up your hormones, which is good for reducing the growth of the neuroendocrine tumor, good for reducing some of your symptoms, but it can also reduce the hormones that tell the enzymes to be produced. Therefore, that can re result in a reduction. Just to bear in mind, this doesn't happen to everybody for each of these conditions, but it's just something to be, to be aware of. So what do we do if somebody does have pancreatic enzyme insufficiency? So what we'll have to do is we've got to artificially give you the enzymes. And the main one that's available here in Ireland is called Creon. So generally what we tend to start people on is Creon 25,000. And what we'd say is to take two with main meals and one with your snacks or milky drinks or any kind of supplements that you take. Now, just to bear in mind, this is a starting dose. So it's, it, this dose can be increased, it can be decreased, and it really will just depend on you, your symptoms, what you eat day to day. And you may find that you may need to adjust your dose as time goes on as well. The main things then to remember with Creon is how it works best is if you take it with a PPI. So that would be something called Lansoprazole, Pantoprazole, Emeprazole. You might also know them like as Proteum, Nexium. And what happens is, is that will reduce the acid in your stomach. And sorry, 
that will reduce the acid in your stomach. And by reducing the acid in the stomach, the creon works better in less acidic environments. The other thing to remember is you need to take it with a cold drink. Hot, they're very sensitive, so hot drinks can denature the enzyme, make, making it not work as effectively as it would have had otherwise. So we say take with a cold drink. Also, you want to take it, um, take it with the first mouthful or just before you start eating so that it can mix with the food. If you're on more than one creon, you can take one at the beginning, one halfway through, one at the end, um, along those lines. But your main thing is, is to mix it in, with, is to get it to mix with the food. It works best for the first half an hour. So if your meal is going to be spread out over a long time, you will need to take an extra one. Um, also, just storage, it needs to be kept in a cool, cool, dark place. So I think sometimes some of the issues can be, is especially with men, they'll just tend to wrap a few up in a tissue and pop it in their pocket, and the body heat will be just too hot for it, and it can denature it and, and not allow it to work. Um, so that would be the main things with starting on it. Um, so there's certain foods that we don't need crayon um, to digest, and that would be kind of anything with just simple sugars, and they also tend to be fat-free. So things like jellies, marshmallows, boiled sweets, also fruit and vegetables, if you're just having vegetables on your own. The exception for that one would be avocados and potatoes. They both need enzymes. And then your fat, quite fatty foods, they're gonna need more enzymes, because fat is harder to digest, and so things like if you're having your pizza, so that's kind of why people do tend to reduce down the fat naturally in their food. But what we say is not to avoid anything. It's a case of getting your enzyme dose right. So it might be that you'll need extra enzymes. So if you have something with a lot of cream, a lot of butter, pastry, any kind of takeaway, fried foods, your Sunday dinners, all things like that, they're all going to need an extra crayon. Um, but I'll go through that in more detail. And what I kind of did was just kind of pretended that we have a patient. So we'll say Mary, and she is just started on some crayon. She feels that it has really helped her symptoms she, the majority of the time. So she started on her two with her main meals and one with her snacks. So most of the time she's perfectly fine, but occasionally she's finding that she's getting some feelings of indigestion, extra wind, and then less occasionally, but still happening, she gets the odd bit of pale yellow stools. So just kind of what I did was just kind of looked at three different meals here. So they all kind of look roughly the same size. And what we would need to consider is just the difference in what would be in them. So meal one, we have our spaghetti bolognese. So you've got your meat, your minced meat, and your pasta. Um, so she'll take two with that. Absolutely fine. That's perfect. So she's quite good. Now, bear in mind, if this is you, you might need one with this. You might need five with this. Everybody will be different. Then following week, she has some lasagna. Quite similar. You've got some pasta. You've got some mince. Very same kind of principle idea behind it. But what you have extra is your extra kind of sauces here. So that's going to be a creamy sauce and extra cheese on top. So what we'd say is extra fat in here, you're going to need at least one extra crayon. So we've just said three for this, for this meal. Following week, very similar, lasagna again, except for this time we've got some garlic bread with it. Could be chips as well or something like that. Both of those quite fatty. You're going to have your extra butter on there. And with that, you're going to need another. So we've said four here. Um, so it's just bearing in mind, even though three meals are quite similar, they might need something different related to the fat content. The other bit then as well is I've just got two bowls of rice, rice pudding here. Mary tends to have a bowl of rice pudding every evening. Normally, she has the one, oh, sorry. Normally, she has this small bowl here. And she takes one crayon, she's fine. Thursday evening, she's, ex she's extra hungry. She has this little bit, she has an extra big bowl. This one is probably, you're gonna say, close to two to three times as big. So she is gonna need an extra one to two crayon with that, kind of varying depending on it. So it's just to bear those things in mind. 
then we're just kind of going to look at kind of a lot of the issues people have can be eating out, going to events. It is that bit harder to kind of figure out what you should do with it. And I'm just going to, we're just going to pretend Mary's attending a wedding. So it's going to draw out, the meal will be on probably an hour and a half, two hours, really just depending when they'll do speeches and things like that. So we would say to take the crayon for each course because it'll only work for half an hour. So course one, you have, this is supposed to be chicken volivants. <laughs> um, <laughs> it doesn't look very like it, but it was the best I could find. Um, so with that, you've got your pastry and you've got your creamy sauce. So she's probably gonna need about two extra if she normally would take about one for this. So that's an extra two there. Then we're on to the soup. So our next, next course, Veg cream of vegetable soup. You're thinking, great, vegetables, I don't need any. But you have got the cream on it. Also, depending on whether she has some bread, um, has some butter on the bread, you might need an extra one. But I would say definitely you would need at least one with that. Also, to bear in mind, it is very tempting to go, oh, I'll have the soup and I'll wash down my tablets with that. Again, it's hot. It can make the enzymes not work as effectively, so do take it with a cold water. Um, now we're on to the mains. So especially when you eat out. <laughs> so I know we're here in a hotel today um, and they do add on a lot of extra fat when you eat out. So I think that sometimes is why a lot of people can get extra problems when they eat out. The mashed potatoes have extra cream or butter in them. The vegetables have extra butter. Things are roasted. The gravy will have meat juices. These things will all add on extra fat. So we're just saying here with the, with the roast dinner, you're gonna need at least an extra two, if not three crayon. So we're probably talking about Mary might be, her usual dose being two, she might be taking five for this. Also as well, another kind of reason why it can be quite good to kind of split up the dose um, by taking one in the beginning, maybe two in the middle, two at the end, two in the beginning, is she might not eat that, eat all of this. She's already had her starter, she's already had her um, soup, so she might not be as hungry. So it can be a good idea to split it so she might only eat half of this. So she might just need the two at the beginning and one at the end. So it'll really just depend on the amount as well as the fat. And then lastly, she's having some dessert. So kind of for each of these little ones, you're, you're talking at least one and then you're gonna have some cream in here. So you're gonna need two with that. So really just depending on how much she eats, it'll depend on how much crayon she needs. So I think Kind of what we're saying is, I'm not giving you any definite answers with all of this. I'm aware of that. And it is anything, anywhere between 12 to 16 crayon with this meal alone. And some people might even need 20. But I think some of the with it is, is that it'll be a little bit of figuring it out. So some people say, oh, I just can't handle cream at all. I take an extra crayon and it does nothing. You might need three extra. So it is a little bit of a, you have to figure it out a, to a certain extent to yourself. So generally we try to help people to figure it out, but there will be ways in which you need to, some people take food and symptom diaries um, to go through for what they're having, what they're eating, and to see if they are getting extra symptoms and where they are and where they might need some extra. But kind of what it is, it's different than other medications in that there isn't an upper limit. So it's completely different to your paracetamol whereby you you know, maximum your eight per day. So it's completely different than that. You can take 20, 30, it really just depends. And I think that's, a lot of people find that confusing. And I think as well, because when, we pres when it's prescribed, it's prescribed as so many per day. And that's because we have to give something to the pharmacist and saying, this is how many to give. So it'll be some days you'll have more, some days you'll have different. Every meal is different, every, every day will be different, week by week will be different, and it'll really just depend. Holidays will be different, all those lines. And if you're a little bit in doubt, and say you're out, say you are at that wedding, it, might, it would be safer to take the extra, because you can't overdose on it. So it's along those lines for those days. And then at home is the time to experiment with it and play around with it when you know that you're near a toilet, if you need to lie down, that's available for you as well. So the other re another reason 
um, that you may have malabsorption is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, it's called. So it's quite a bit of a mouthful, so don't feel you have to write that one down. Um, so with that, you're more at risk. So, sorry, I'm going, just going back. The symptoms, very same as with pancreatic enzyme insufficiency. So it can be a little bit tricky to try and distinguish the two of them. Um, with when you're more at risk of it is any kind of surgery to the tummy, intestines, colon, you may be at risk of it with that. Also, if you're not producing enough enzymes, with that you'll also produce um, pancreatic juices, and if you're not producing that, that normally kind of washes the bacteria down into your colon, which is where we want it. So really with the bacterial overgrowth, what it is, is an extra, bac extra bacteria up in your small intestine, and it's preventing or kind of blocking your food and nutrients from being absorbed. Um, and the treatment then for that is, so normally what we'll try and do is to see if it might be the pancreatic enzyme insufficiency, if you're at risk of that, and try and increase the creon. If that doesn't work and you still have symptoms of malabsorption, they might then try you on a course of antibiotics for two weeks. It's quite a high course. And then there is talk as well about probiotics. So with probiotics, we don't, to be honest, we don't know what strain of probiotics might help bacterial overgrowth, or we don't know what dosage. So generally, we'll just say to take a high-dose, multi-strain probiotic. So things like um, Udo Super 8 or BioCult. But the main thing also with the probiotics is to stay on the same one for at least eight weeks um, so that it can build up in your system. Some people stay on it continuously, and it may help prevent bacterial overgrowth, but it's, it'll be different from person to person. Um, and then lastly, the other cause of malabsorption might be bile acid malabsorption. And this is because the bile acids normally mix with your food, so they come from down from your gallbladder. And, and if they're not available to mix with your food, you can get the steatorrhea, the kind of fat in the stools that we talked about, and actually the same symptoms again um, with that. And your main, the main people who would be at risk of that are those that have had their gallbladder removed or if they've got some kind of blockage in their, gall, in their bile duct that, le that brings the bile from your gallbladder into your intestine. Um, so you'd need to check that with your doctors if that's something that you've had done. Um, or if you do have a blockage there. Um, the treatment then would be some bile salts. Um, same, they're same again, you take, start off generally with two sachets a day and can increase to three, four, five, six, seven, eight, um, just depending on your symptoms. And you take them with food as well. Um, so I think it's just important to realize that you may have more than one cause of malabsorption. And it is a case of trial and error, and we don't always have the answer in the first first case, and it'll be to go through all of them and see if we can help with the symptoms with regards to that. Then also, I think, as well, um, you might actually just have diarrhea itself. So how we can tell that's different from your malabsorption diarrhea is that it'll be water, far more watery, um, I'm not expecting you to weigh it or anything, but it is more than 200 grams per day. And also, it's going more than three times per day. So it's quite different from that point of view. Lots of different things can cause it. Um, so as we've mentioned before, um, your treatment, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, following surgery to the intestines, um, any medications that you're on, any of those may be the cause. Treatment. It'll vary from person to person. So this is kind of like, as we said, oh, well, well, my friend had this, and this is what they did. It'll be a trial and error in getting what works for you. So some people might reduce down their, uh, reduce their fiber intake overall. And I have got some slides with high fiber and low fiber, so just so that you can be aware of which, of which foods may be more suitable for you and what to try. Um, also, reducing your intake of insoluble fiber so that would be things like bran, um, so like your bran flakes, um, all bran, things along those lines that may increase it. Also the seeds, and so any kind of seeds or nuts, 
and also your seeds and your fruit and the skin on vegetables and fruit. Um, so it's not that you completely need to avoid your fruit or vegetables, but just avoid the skins and the seeds. Um, and increase your soluble fiber. So that's things like porridge. Um, your fruit is actually soluble fiber. It's just to avoid the skins and the... So things like kiwis, you are going to have the seeds in it, so they're unavoidable. So we just say to avoid those ones, but peel an apple or get peaches in a tin that are already peeled for you. Also, sometimes people find they tolerate cooked vegetables better. So whereas a salad may completely tear, feel like it's tearing you up and you have to go to the toilet straight after, things like cooked vegetables may work better for you. Um, other things, just kind of general things that we'd say that might work would be to make sure that you eat regular meals. That just helps keep the GI system, your stomach and your whole intestine system kind of on a regular flow. Also, it's important to keep your fluids up, partly because you're going to be losing a lot of fluids, so you do want to make sure that you are hydrated and keep your caffeine levels down. Um, one, because caffeine is going to dehydrate you a little bit and also because caffeine can stimulate the bowels. So that can increase the diarrhea. So stick to a maximum of two cups of coffee. And then the last thing that sometimes people try will be like your probiotics. And I would say the same as kind of the ones that I mentioned before. Or sometimes people may find that things like your little bottle drinks like Actimel or Yakult or the supermarkets like Duns and Tesco do their own like probiotics. They can help as well. Um, less they'll have lesser strains of, of bacteria in them. So it may take longer to figure out which one of them work um, along those lines. But if you find an improvement, it's the same thing again. You need to stay on the same probiotic for at least six to eight weeks to help build up your bacteria levels. Um, so this is kind of, as I mentioned, all the foods that are high in fiber. I won't read them all out to you here just because we'll be here all day um, just reading through them. but. It'll just be the main kind of things would be in terms of your vegetables, things like sweet corns, peas, beans, lentils. Those kind of ones are going to be extra higher. Your brown bread, brown rice, brown pasta, fruits. Um, so especially things like avocados um, will be higher. Also um, dried fruit can cause quite a reaction. Prunes. Um, and then also things like nuts and seeds will be quite high. Um, and then this here is the low fiber. So this is quite different from kind of what you'll hear will be recommended in general for the general population. And I think what you sometimes have to consider is how your symptoms are different than what the general population can be. So that's why we may be re recommending things that sound strange. So like we'll say to kind of stick to a maximum of two portions of fruit and peel it. Um, and with the two portions, it would be like a portion would be an apple, um, a portion would be like 10 grapes, 10 strawberries, or smaller fruits like two plums, slice of mango, slice of, slice of melon, along those lines, they'd all be a portion. And the same with the vegetables, you want to stick to two portions, and two heaped dessert spoons of vegetables would be your portion. So it's to bear in mind that you... Uh, Sometimes we will treat people differently depending on their symptoms and depending on their diagnosis. Um, and then I'm just going to go through carcinoid syndrome, um, which will be slightly different again. So carcinoid syndrome is when your body is producing too much serotonin. And your main symptoms are going to be your wheezing, your flushing, diarrhea, gas, and bloating. So this, the following things would would relate to people with these symptoms and with this, this syndrome. So your trigger foods. So there isn't as such any kind of research into what would be the main causes and what would be the main trigger foods. But what the Carcinoid Association in the States did, I think it was about 10 years ago actually, they send out surveys to all their patients and they got the most common trigger foods. So some of these foods you might be absolutely fine with. Some of them you definitely might have problems. There might be more. So this list isn't exhaustive, but this is just in terms of the general things that most people may have a problem with. So the main kind of things that come up were really large meals. 
Um, so it's, kind of, it's a case of eating little and often so that you can still get your calories and your protein in rather than having a sitting down to a big, big meal. So uh, trying to avoid having breakfast in the morning and not eating again till evening time. It's trying to get into the regular eating pattern. Um, other things would be quite high fat content in the food. Um, that tends to cause issues. Also alcohol, spicy food. And then they kind of, they grouped foods together in that foods that tended to be high in amines tended to cause problems. So the main kind of things that are high in amines would be your cheeses. Um, so it would be your aged cheeses, which is actually most cheeses. So things like cheddar, gouda, Swiss, your brie, your camembert, they're all aged cheeses. Um, also quite high in fat, so, that, so kind of in both terms, they may cause the issue. Also alcohol, um, your smoked or salted fish would be, can be a problem. Um, anything with yeast, fermented tofu, miso, and sauerkraut. And then also in moderate amounts, the, the foods that tended to cause problems would be caffeine. Now that's in large doses, so again, sticking to a maximum of two cups per day. Chocolate, unfortunately, lots of nuts, including peanuts, um, coconut, Brazil nuts, also things like avocados, raspberries, they all tended to be the main things that came back in causing problems. Um, so it's a little bit like, so it's easy to kind of say, oh, well, you can't have these. But it's, I think it's important as well that you know what kind of things you can eat. So in terms of meat um, it, and fish, it's your fresh meat and fish. That's absolutely fine. But things like bacon is going to be salted or your smoked fish, like smoked salmon, smoked haddock, any of those, they, we'd say to avoid all of those. Sausages, black pudding there to avoid, but anything fresh, so like your chicken, turkey, any of the unprocessed ones, any lean beef, lean steaks, any of those, they're all okay. Um, in terms of vegetables, we say all vegetables, but generally people with the syndrome tend to tolerate cooked vegetables better, and especially like your root vegetables, so that would be carrots, parsnips, turnips, um, your swedes, anything along those lines. Veg, um, sorry, fruit, um, again, some people might do better without the skins, um, but we'd say any fruit except for your banana, raspberries, and avocados. Um, unaged cheeses, so what's left in the cheese world, uh, would be, you'd need to check for the mozzarella, and then things like low-fat cream cheese, low-fat low ricotta, and low-fat cottage cheese. Things like low-fat yogurts, low-fat milk. And the reason why we're saying the low-fat is just because of the, the cause with the, the fat content causing problems rather than milk being high in amines. And then your unprocessed soya, so like edamine, you know, the little green beans, and soy milk, they're all okay. Um, so then just I just had a quickly look at vipomas just because they can cause quite watery diarrhea and they can result in electrolyte disturbances and can can result in low potassium, low phosphate. And the main kind of treatment with that would be you definitely, if you're having quite watery diarrhea, you want to keep your fluids up. You may also want to take an oral replacement sachet. Um, to drink, and that's because it'll have your electrolytes as well, and it'll help replace those. And some people find a low fiber diet can help, but it may not help completely. But just it may help slightly. So I think it's any help that you can you can do along those lines in terms of diet. Um, and then also because you may end up with lower potassium, we'd say to include a high potassium diet. So your things with potassium, I think everyone knows about bananas but also fruits like mangoes, dried fruits, um, your potatoes, especially jacket potatoes, roast potatoes, chips, they're all high in potassium. Um, Vegetable-wise, things like spinach, Brussels sprouts, baked beans, because the beans are high, and then with the tomato sauce. Tomatoes have quite a bit of potassium, particularly the juice, so if you have a tin of tomatoes, make sure you include the juice. Um, also things like nuts are quite high. Dairy has some potassium, so making sure that you keep your dairy intake up, so more than a pint of milk per day, or like half a pint of milk and some yogurts or some cheese. 
And then breakfast cereals with dry, dried fruits and nuts, just because the dried fruits and nuts would be high. Um, so with this, and I guess with diarrhea, we're always kind of concerned with any nutritional deficiencies. And your main thing with the nutritional deficiencies is what we first of all want to do is to try and treat the cause. So you will. So if you have malabsorption, you may be at risk of being low levels of fat-soluble vitamins, so your A, D, E, and K. And what w the main thing that we would say to do is to treat the cause. So what we want to do is get the malabsorption under control so that then you can absorb your, your fat-soluble vitamins. If you're not absorbing, you may be taking vitamins, minerals, and they may not be, they may not be actually being absorbed, so it's going to be impossible to bring up the level. Also things like, um, depending on the type of surgery that you've had, so especially things like with gastric surgery. So if you've had all your stomach removed, you won't be able to fully process your vitamin B12. So you will need a B12 injection, meaning we need it to go directly into your, vein, uh, into your veins. Um, there, you could be taking B12 until it goes out, until it goes out the door, but it won't, you won't absorb it. Also as well, um, with calcium and iron, so you do absorb a little bit of calcium and iron in your stomach. We don't know, to be honest with you, how much the rest of your intestine will adapt. So sometimes you may be given an extra calcium and iron supplement, or it may just be a general multivitamin and mineral that will contain your calcium and your iron will be enough. Um, with watery diarrhea, so kind of as we mentioned, it's trying to control the cause as much as possible. That can lead to magnesium, zinc, um, f potassium, phosphate, as we mentioned. So your oral replacement supplements will help with that to an extent. And it may also be that you might need a general multivitamin and mineral to top it up if you have ongoing diarrhea. Also, um, with, with, this, with carcinoid syndrome, you will, it is as a result, as we mentioned, of producing too much serotonin. So serotonin is made from a protein that makes the same, that makes your B vitamin, B3, niacin. So as a lot of the extra protein is gone into making your serotonin, unfortunately, instead of the B vitamin, B3, niacin, you may get a deficiency in that. So a lot of people might be on a vitamin B complex or you might need an individual supplement of niacin itself. Um, that would be one of the main, the only ones that we would say that you would may need just the actual vitamin itself. And then um, also with that, because because the extra protein has gone into making the serotonin, we recommend that you do have a high protein diet to account for the extra losses or the extra uses of your protein. Um, unfortunately, if you've cut out protein, it's not going to to stop your production of the serotonin, it will get it'll get the protein from somewhere. So it'll take it from your muscles, um, it'll take it from, um, it'll convert your fat cells into it, it'll convert the glycogen in your liver into protein. So really we want to keep the levels up. Um, so with that, we would then say high protein diet. And um, what that generally means is to try to include something with protein in it with each meal and a couple of snacks in the day. So that can be your lean protein sources like your chicken, your fish, um, lean cuts of red meat, also things like beans, lentils, those kind of things. If you can tolerate them, they're also high um, in protein, eggs, and your dairy. Um, to include some high protein snacks, so that could be things like a glass of low fat milk, bowl of cereal with low fat milk, an egg sandwich, some of your unaged cheeses, so like some mozzarella on some crackers, a low-fat yogurt. Um, and you can include things like the high protein yogurts. Um, a lot of them are, they've a lot of them have exploded on the market recently. Um, there's lots of different types. So there's Liberty, there's Dunedinone, there's Glenisk, there's those zero percent total. So there's a huge variety of them now. You might also see that there's high protein milk. Um, or else you can make your own high protein milk by adding in skim milk powder into the milk as well. And the best option is just to choose some of your high biological value proteins. And what we mean by that would be proteins from an animal source. So trying to choose those more often. So that would be your dairy, your meat, your fish.
they'd all be high biological value. And that just means it's easier for your body to use those proteins. Um, and then lastly, what we kind of say is, and we kind of leave this more to the end, if you're still having a lot of problems with diarrhea, um, also getting symptoms with like wind, cramps, those kind of things, we might suggest a FODMAP diet. So just to bear in mind, it's quite a difficult diet to follow. We definitely would say to try everything else first. And if that's not working for you, then we, you know definitely try the probiotics, try the low-fiber diets, see how, see how things are with those. And if there's no improvement, we may try this just to see if it would help. But I would definitely recommend going to see a dietitian about it. It is, you're avoiding quite a lot of foods. So you're avoiding fructose, oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. So there's quite, and they're in quite a long list of range of foods. I haven't even gone into it just because it's, it's too complicated and you'd need an hour in itself just to go through it. Um, but also, which I forgot to mention actually, it might be useful just to check because the most common FODMAPs that people have a problem with are onions and garlic. So it might be useful to check them first. And then I guess um, what I'm looking at is, is that a lot of, what we touched on earlier is that a lot of people might be losing weight and this may not be beneficial in terms of your treatment, also um, in terms of kind of keeping muscle mass strength up. So I've just touched a little bit on that and kind of the main things we just say to do would be to rather if you're not able to eat big meals, eat little and often. Um, eat what you fancy when you fancy it. If you fancy a bowl of cereal for dinner, so be it. Have a bowl of cereal. If you want your dinner in the morning first thing, if when it feel when you feel a bit better, have it. Don't feel like you have to follow by the rules of convention. And if you want three bowls of cereal and that's all you feel like in a day, that's what you have. Um, it might be as well just trying to take in a bit of exercise that can help build up your appetite, especially outdoors, just getting some fresh air can help. Also, um, things like, you know, if you can get help, take it. Don't, don't feel like you're too proud. If you're feeling quite weak, you're, it's a vicious circle and it can kind of be ongoing. Stock up your cupboards with things with that will stay in date. So get like rice puddings in cans, things like that stock up the freezer so that there's no panic with needing so that what you fancy is there when you fancy it. And then fortify food, which I've just gone through here, but I'll let you have a look at it on the slide just in terms of time-wise, but it'll just be, it's a little bit of the things. So if you're losing a lot of weight and you're not having problems symptom-wise, we'd say do add in the extra fat, do have the extra cream, butter, cheese. I have put things in red just um, just kind of conscious that if you are having problems with fat, they're the suitable options that you can have. And then lastly, it would be things like nourishing drinks. So things like um, milkshakes, milk itself, um, hot chocolates, Horlicks, anything along those lines. Fruit smoothies, just making sure they're met up with yogurts or milk, um, or things like Complan and Buildup. And then obviously, losing weight and losing too much weight isn't a problem, isn't an issue for everybody. So just if you've got your symptoms under control, we just say to f follow the general health eating guidelines, which are trying to cook things as much as possible yourself, including plenty of fruit and vegetable to your vegetables to your tolerance, avoid adding extra sugar and salt to foods, and trying to include a variety, a rainbow of colors in terms of your, your fruits and vegetables. And then lastly, it's just kind of, just something that I didn't go into in too much detail, but I think, I guess in this day and age, there's so many different things on the internet. And you'll, every time you Google neuroendocrine tumors and diet or cancer and diet, long lists of things come up. And I just, rather than going through everything individually, um, it's just to bear in mind, anything that you are thinking of taking, it is definitely worth checking with your doctors to see if they'll, interfere with your medications. Also, I think as well, I, what we've got to be mindful is, is that a lot of the people who are telling you to take vitamin A will then have a link to sell you vitamin A. So there is just quite a good website, um, the MSKCC one, and that goes through pretty much every extra vitamin, every extra herb, every extra supplement that you, 
you can think of, and it goes through kind of the full evidence behind it. So it's just a good reference point for you to check, just because it's so confusing with everything that is out there and what you should or shouldn't be doing. Um, and the other one then, the can w.cancer.ie, they ha that's the Irish Cancer Society, they also have um, some information on theirs as well, but that's just along more general lines. But, and it's just, yeah, definitely check with your doctor um, before you start anything. And then some of them, if you are having chemotherapy, definitely to avoid joy. But yeah, and I'll wait for the question and answers for the questions, but. <laughs>